I'm not going to talk a lot about data today, but um, David did make the point about 650 um, reports of family violence um, a week, uh, sorry, a day in Australia. That's police are turning up to premises about once every eight minutes. Um, just be really clear um, that this is the tip of the iceberg. We're not saying 650 incidents happen a day. Far, far more than that happen. Um, so it's an enormous problem, an enormous impact on our community. So before I begin though, please allow me to also acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet, the people of the Kulin Nation. It is upon their ancestral lands that this place is built and I pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. And today, on White Ribbon Day, which is also the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women and Children, I also acknowledge the many thousands of women and children who have been murdered, maimed or otherwise harmed by those men who have professed to love them. It's for them that we do what we do. So I'm not going to open up with statistics and I'm not being dismissive of the, of the statistics. They're very, very important. And as a former police officer, I dealt with numbers all the time, every, every day. Data was important to me. Our policies needed to be guided by the evidence, not by suspicion, not by prejudice, not by habit, and certainly not by populism. But we should remember, there are very painful personal stories behind those statistics. There are also attitudes and cultural complacency. And that's what this research tells us today. In the decades I spent at Victoria Police, I saw and heard things. Abuse, violence and neglect. Some things I will never ever forget. But when I was presented with this research, it touched me. In this study, children and young adults already possess some disparating ideas about themselves and about gender. When presented with some scenarios on aggression by boys, I heard with sadness about 10-year-old girls already diminishing the abuse they received from boys. I heard girls say about boys harassing them, it's not that bad, it's not like he punched her. I heard boys justifying the violence by simply saying that they just want to be heard, that it was harmless. And for the, all the things I've seen in my many, many years at Victoria Police, this important evidence of the origins of gendered violence and our complacency to it brought me to tears. As a community, how have we got it so wrong? I felt embarrassed. I felt ashamed. It did get me thinking though. The state, with all its powers and authority, is simply not enough to stop the fundamental drivers of family violence. When I was Chief Commissioner of Victoria Police, I led an organisation of nearly 17,000 people the vast majority of them being sworn <coughs> officers. An organisation of men and women of enormous powers, talents and responsibility. A police force is one of the state's most powerful and, manifest, and obvious manifestations of power. I led forensic teams and detectives, the special operations group and water police and thousands and thousands of men and women patrolling our streets and our communities 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Men and women trained in counter-terrorism, negotiating hostage sieges and intelligently interviewing killers. In other words, men and women of great training and commitment, each who had been empowered by the state. But here's what I thought when I saw this research. For all the training, the equipment, the power to investigate and arrest, none of this. None of this can touch the attitudes we impress on our children. None of this 
can enter our homes, our minds or our families. None of this can alter the way we think about ourselves or our children. The state's power is mostly executed at the very end of the family violence continuum. It's when the ideas and values adopted as children have grown destructively. The police operate at one end. This research speaks at the other end, where the violence is formed. This research tells us there are some poisonous and deeply entrenched ideas about gender. I'll explain some of them soon, but I want to suggest to you today that it is not the state's role to modify or refine our shared values. That's a job for each and every one of us. And we have done it before. We have modified values. So let's look at child abuse. I think it's a very powerful example. We forget that child protection legislation is a relatively new development. For centuries and centuries, children were considered property, exploited for sex, for labour, for the rough, rough depositing of our own values. Historically, we had a casual contempt for children. Casual in that the contempt was buried deeply, practised often, but rarely thought about. Attitudes can be very difficult to change because after a while they become invisible. They're as natural as taking a breath. The Royal Commission into Child Abuse has exposed decades of squalid and systematic abuse of our children. Recent decades were filled with men who winked happily about their preferences for schoolgirls. Their behaviour was seen as harmlessly roguish. Just another example of boys being boys. Jimmy Savile and Rolf Harris were vile predators, but they were helped by a complacent culture. Why am I making the link between child abuse and family violence? Because for decades, our casual complacency and contempt for children allowed child abuse to prosper. And in 2015, our culture is possessed of similarly destructive attitudes about gender that allow domestic violence to prosper. The research says as much. Attitudes that are so embedded that we don't challenge them. We can't challenge them because at times we can't even see them. This research confirms what I've long suspected, that the abuse of women is supported from an early, very early age. The research confirms that adults are harmfully shaping children's destinies because of unchallenged and unfair assumptions about gender. And what this research emphasises, and its findings are repeated in countless other studies, is that we develop male privilege very early in our lives. Knowingly or not, we give boys the licence to act abusively and we develop in our girls a deference to that behaviour. Boys will be boys and it's up to girls to adjust accordingly. But this view confuses cultural values with biological ones. This isn't nature, this is in fact nurture and I'll explain. The research reveals stark patterns in our parenting and mentoring of our children. Now this isn't theory, this is the voice of our kids that we're hearing. It's our voice, it's society's voice. We make excuses for boys and subtly encourage girls to do the same. We are sympathetic to boys' behaviour and more suspicious of girls. We dismiss boys' sexual aggression as a function their masculinity. We minimise the behaviour. We rationalise it. Boys will be boys. But it is different for girls. Boys are taught to blame circumstance for their aggression. Girls to contemplate how they might have provoked it. Boys learn by acting out. Girls by simply enduring their experiences. Boys are told it's appropriate to, to offend yourself against a girl, but this isn't a reciprocal lesson. 
This often leads to boys externalising their behaviour. When things go bad, it's because of other people or other things. But we encourage girls to internalise their experiences, to imagine that the fault lies somewhere deep inside of them. This research exposes mothers asking their boys, what did the girl, what did the girl do? Because they hope that it isn't their son's fault. Can't we see what we're doing here? The deck is stacked against women in our community. We're encouraging girls to feel complicit in their own abuse. We're asking them to blame themselves. This internalisation, once started in childhood, can become lifelong. During early development, children are like blotting paper and dubious lessons can become permanent. But not only do we encourage girls to blame themselves, we blame them too. Only a few weeks ago, Detective Jason Walsh from Victoria Police went on local radio to discuss a brutal and sadistic rape. The radio host read out a few text messages from listeners um, that asked, what was a young girl doing in a park at 4am? I thought these questions were callous and misguided and evidently Detective Walsh did too. And this was his response. I find it amazing that we question girls and we question their behaviour but we don't ask what are four blokes doing allegedly raping a young girl? And Walsh went on. You know, that's my take on that sort of question. I've been in this sexual assault field for many years. I find it frustrating that people straight away question females about their action. I mean, what are four males doing allegedly gang raping a young girl? So let me go back to those questions being asked on local radio. I would find those questions about the victim amazing, amazing too, if I wasn't so aware of what we teach our children. If I wasn't so aware of how casually we accept male bravado and entitlement and how easily we teach our girls to simply avoid it. What are we doing when we hear of an alleged gang rape and only think of why the victim was in the park? What are we doing when that is our first question? Let's pause on this because I do need your help. Together, we need to talk about it. We need to talk about what unseen expectations we have of our children because of their gender. I think we ask women to define, define themselves relative to men. If we, if we dismiss behaviours as boys being boys, we aren't holding them personally, personally accountable. We aren't addressing the preconditions of sexism, abuse and family violence. I'm enormously grateful that Victoria Police has people like Jason Welsh. And I'm grateful for his comments. They're important, they're compelling, and they're wise. Politicians, business leaders, community leaders, all of us should take notice of Jason's words. Those text messages are simply just the tip of the iceberg. Those messages are proof of an expansive system of thought we are casually giving to our children. If this upsets you, well so be it. If it offends you, so be it. Your job, our job, is to move beyond that defensiveness. Your job, our job, is to view our discomfort as the beginning, not the end. If you need help, let me give you an example of our double standards. It comes from another story I heard from a detective. Years ago, a young woman came into a police station early in the morning. She was seriously distressed. She told the officers that she had just been sexually assaulted in a lame way. She had come straight to the station from the site of the attack. She had said she'd been attacked from behind when her assailant, and when her assailant gripped her and placed a strip sorry, when her, when her assailant gripped her, he placed a strip of electrical tape over her mouth. Horrific and frightening. But her claims were met with suspicion. 
Some officers weren't as responsive as they should have been. But there was one investigator, a thorough and credulous man. He took the victim into a room, consoled her and took a statement. And then later that day, he went to the scene when others thought it was nothing more than an exaggeration. He paced the laneway, turning clumps of leaves over with his toe. And then he saw it, a piece of electrical tape. He crouched beside it and saw a print of lipstick on it. So here's something I've noticed. Claims of sexual assault inspire a higher level of suspicion that isn't, by, that isn't uh, necessarily inspired by claims of theft, fraud or street assaults. Our, that, our level of doubt is much higher for women. Almost as, as if we assume women have less credibility, whether it is in a sexual assault or family violence. I can tell you that false claims of sexual assault do occur, just as they occur for theft, fraud and street assaults. And I can tell you that the vast majority of sexual assault claims and family violence claims are legitimate. So to those men who fixate on the bogus claims, I say to you that you are being intellectually dishonest. You are emotionally cherry-picking data to make a case that women fundamentally lack credibility. The data doesn't agree, and nor do I. We do possess double standards, standards that are deeply ingrained and are a damaging outcome of our attitudes. This can result in many women feeling an intense, silencing guilt about their own abuse and alienation. So we need leadership, but before that leadership can happen, we do require some self-reflection. Self-reflection is something that this research suggests is both vital and in short supply. It helps refine our collective values, but it's in deficit because humans are naturally resistant to criticism. So let this speech be a wake-up call, a wake-up call to our assumptions and complacency it's not enough to consider ourselves good men because we don't bash women. As men, this sets the bar very, very low and that somehow we congratulate others for not being monsters. That's not useful and it's not helpful. I'm asking you to think about yourselves, about your assumptions, about what lessons you are unwittingly, unwittingly passing on to our young people. In public life, I've noticed a sort of blokey pomposity, a desire to be seen as a community leader, but sometimes not matched in the desire to properly function as one. The result is often a thousand empty gestures, each removed from self-reflection and real influence. There are many leaders in the room today. We, as leaders, must acknowledge our own role in these attitudes before we offer ourselves as role models. Our public status is simply not enough. We need to ask ourselves, are we flattering our ego or engaging in humble self-reflection? I would argue we need self-reflection before we need insincere mutterings when the next woman or child is murdered by the very men who profess to love them. It is not self-reflection is not vague, nor is it indulgent. It's courageous and it is necessary. Self-reflection shapes how we connect to our children, how we mentor our young adults. Everyone in this room understands that our young people are bright and attentive and they are watchful for inconsistency. They have advanced radars for hypocrisy. And one of the boys interviewed said, the message has to be consistent. If I hear one thing, but everyone else is doing something else, it means absolutely nothing to me. Lectures are not enough. Our public statements must match our private behaviour. If we truly believe that the future of our girls is as bright as our boys, we need to meet that desire with something other than vague commitments 
on one day a year. It needs to be matched with our lessons, both spoken and lived. How often do we tell our daughters what to wear, but rarely tell our sons what respectful sexual relations are? How often do we warn our daughters about provocation, but rarely talk to our boys about consent? How often do we justify the cruelty of boys and ask our girls to simply avoid it? How often do we thoughtlessly accept that boys will be boys? The answer is every single day. We do this as easily as taking a breath and sometimes we don't even know we're doing it. Collectively, we failed our children. The collectively, again, may make some of you feel uncomfortable. I didn't abuse children, you might think, and you can put a full stop on your reflection. But visit the thousands of pages of Royal Commission transcripts. Look at the transcript of the Rolf Harris trial. Read the testimony of Jimmy Savile's colleagues. You'll see that it isn't just vile, manipulative men that can be singled out and condemned. I don't bash my wife, you say. Another full stop. But look into the coronial inquest into women killed by their partners. Friends saw it, work colleagues saw it, teachers saw it, many saw it. These men are supported by indulgent and unaccountable cultures. These men are supported by a society that encourages its females to, victims to blame themselves and stay quiet in shame. These men are supported <coughs> by our complacency by our lack of courage to examine our lifelong attitudes. So, when a girl can be allegedly gang raped, and our first question is, why was she in the park at 4am? We need to ask if the culpability is placed where it should be. When we ask that question, we put the victim firmly on the hook. But the fact is, Sadly, she's already there. My question, our question should be, what are we doing? Thank you.